Okay, uh, we are ready and set to begin the webinar. Uh, Kim, you can take over. Thank you Thank very you, much. Jessica. <clears throat> so to fast forward, for all of you that have patiently been waiting for us, um, I am going to just go forward and um, get to the content. Um, the gist of the Voc Rehab Youth Technical Assistance Center that's housed at the Institute for Educational Leadership is working with youth who have disabilities that are out of school or those students um, in school that are <clears throat> that have disabilities that are not receiving special education services under an IEP or 504 plan. And um, through our partnerships, we have developed a curriculum guide on WIOA and Title I and Title IV. And so we have sharing with us information today, um, folks from the National Youth Employment Coalition as well as the State of Washington. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our partners at NYEC. Thanks, Kim. This is uh, Thomas Showalter. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the National Youth Employment Coalition. And uh, I'm here with Don Spangler, who works with NYEC. Uh, we're going to go extra fast here so we can have plenty of time for our uh, state uh, friends to share their wisdom. Um, I will very quickly say that uh, actually this webinar itself is a product of a, a decades-long partnership. IEL is about uh, 55 years old, and NYC turns 40 this year. Uh, we've been working together for decades. Um, so I hope that uh, uh, this partnership can uh, continue to spawn new partnerships in the, the youth employment field. Um, and we're really happy to be uh, uh, part of the webinar today. Uh, there's a little bit about NYEC on the slide here, which you don't need to, I don't need to cover. Uh, please visit our webpage to know, learn more about us. We're also hosting a convening with um, YTAC in uh, Oakland in May, where there's going to, will you have access to a day-long learning lab about uh, better serving out-of-school youth with disabilities. So I hope that you'll think about uh, joining us in May. Um, and this uh, conversation today is about a curriculum guide that we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, and it's a product of conversations with people in a number of states. You can see some overview about uh, what's in the guide. Um, and uh, we've had some previous webinars covering other aspects of that uh, guide. Uh, and I think um, for now, I can quickly turn it over to uh, my colleague Don, who's going to cover a, a couple of slides really quickly just to frame the conversation you're about to hear from our colleagues in Washington. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. and. Uh, thanks for all the great work that you do out there. Thanks, Thomas, uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Um, over the next, uh, I guess, three to five minutes, very quickly, I'm going to try to cover uh, four slides, each of which summarizes some major points from this most recent uh, curriculum guide. Uh, and it, it's also augmented by some quotes from, from VR professionals that we interviewed for the guide. So uh, just beginning uh, at the top here, I mean, why partnerships? Uh, there can be any number of reasons why partnerships are formed. They can be driven by political imperatives. They can be driven by uh, d desire for cost efficiency. They can be driven by sort of a general sense that we would all be better if we worked together. But based on our conversations with you folks, uh, we really concluded that there were two keys. And regardless of how the partnership gets formed in the first instance, uh, partnerships must have value for all partners. Uh, if they don't, then they're simply not a partnership, and they're not going to last. Uh, and m most typically, the value associated with partnerships is most often directly related to our clients getting access to better services, and as a result, of course, demonstrating better outcomes. All right, well, if, um, if the point is for partnerships to help clients, <laughs> why are they so hard? <laughs> well, th there's lots of answers to that, and I think we, we appreciate the fact that our different systems speak different languages, and they have different requirements, and they're measured in different ways, typically. Um, and, and the fact is that many of our programs were created by specific statutory frameworks and requirements that were designed to ensure that people that didn't have access to services uh, did, in fact, get the services they needed and deserved. 
And of course, this has created you know, the notion that we have silos and we have these different separate programs and services. Uh, but, but I think most of us would submit that, in fact, it's obviously a good thing that people are getting the needs, the, the services that, 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 that they need and deserve. But like, more than one thing could be true. That's a good thing, but it also makes it much more difficult sometimes for us to actually to work together because of these different, these different uh, requirements. So um, how do we overcome these challenges? Well, I think uh, we were very encouraged, honestly, uh, by talking to folks around the country, uh, VR and workforce systems, uh, finding ways to work together, uh, new state policies. Texas is a brilliant example. Um, expanding on existing relationships and, and, and basically uh, just, just based on the necessity sometimes of sharing resources when it's the only way to serve clients effectively. But you know, going back in essence to the, to the point of the first slide, uh, we found from talking to you folks that by and large these partnerships are best created and sustained when partners come to understand the institutional self-interest associated with partnerships. Uh, it, you know, it, it, this has to work for the institutions involved. This is not a feel-good operation. This is something that actually makes tangible differences. And most often, this institutional interest takes the form of improved services for clients. Now, the good news is that WIOA uh, begins to create exactly these kinds of opportunities for partnership, because the statute and the regulations in particular promote co-enrollment of 16 to 24-year-olds in adult programming, and also in Title II adult ed and Title IV. VR. And as I think as the point has been made in previous webinars, if you're serving youth and young adults who are 14 to 24 years of age, it's almost a lock that they're also going to be eligible for Title I youth and adult services. And so right away, you, we've overcome the eligibility issues, and so the opportunities for collaboration are, are, are right there. So we owe it doesn't necessarily solve all of the problems associated with partnership formation, but it certainly opens the door for willing partners to walk through. All right, finally, um, we did find and, are, and, and detail in the, uh, the, the partnership guide several uh, key points based on both research and, and frankly, talking to folks who are, who are conducting effective partnerships on, on, on what, what essential components uh, uh, involve. And, and you can see them here, convening key partners and building trust. And I would just underscore the building trust piece when we were trying to create our uh, dropout recovery partnership in Philly. We had community organizations. We had parent groups. We had schools. We had DHS. We had JJ. And a lot of the, 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 these people, frankly, hadn't been in the same room with each other other than maybe a courtroom suing one another. So <laughs> this trust building is hugely important. And sometimes it takes a little longer than you'd like, but it's a key component. Also, we found that uh, the, the, the importance of, of a very clear action-oriented work plan that has responsibilities for all partners collecting data to be sure that, in fact, this is an effective strategy, and, and holding the overall partnership accountable for results, uh, and then important, you know, also celebrating successes, which is also important. Uh, and so the guide contains a much more detailed list, and also has a link to a nifty tool by Dr. Bruce Fry and his colleagues, which can actually help you to gauge the, the effectiveness of the partnership that you have over time. So let me just stop here uh, and thank all of you once again. For, for, for the help that you gave to us, as well as for being with us today. And uh, let me just uh, kick it back over to Kim, who's going to introduce our guests from Washington State. Thanks, Don. I know that was a, <clears throat> a quick, <laughs> quick time for you. Um, we um, are putting up another poll question here before our partners from Washington State um, take the lead. And we want to ask you if you partner with any other systems. And if so, would you please indicate all of the systems um, with which you currently partner to help serve youth with disabilities? You can select more than one, um, and there's quite an extensive list that Jessica um, has posted for us. Jessica, if you could expand the box. And it would make sense that we have a lot of VR people on here as well as workforce, and we'd like to see what some of the other systems are. <clears throat> that you currently engage with. And it looks like a, a large population that's participating uh, or partnering with um, their DD agencies, followed next by um, homeless systems. I'm curious what some of those others are. So if you have a chance to 
kind of type maybe in the chat for us to kind of view what some of those other systems are that may not be reflected in this list above. But overwhelmingly, majority of you are over 83% with workforce, 62% um, with DD and um, the VR agency. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so public schools and universities not indicated there. Thank you, Kim and Penny, for those. Definitely. So there's a wide range. We're going to try and capture a bunch of those out of that chat. So thank you. So I want to turn it over to Cheryl, Kathleen, and Rob. Uh, who can share with us an example from Washington State on partnership. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. This is Rob Hines. Uh, I'm the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Director in Washington State, and it's my privilege to uh, take some time with you today to talk about uh, an exciting partnership. I thought Don's comments were apropos for exactly what we're talking about, so I think we're at the right presentation. So here at the table, um, we've already been introduced, but it's Kathleen from Juvenile Rehabilitation. It's Cheryl from Pacific Mountain Workforce Development Council, myself. And we work also with local school districts who help to make this happen. And what I want you to pay particular attention to is the young justice-involved student in the middle, whom we'll call Marcus. Um, he is the real reason that we are here having this discussion today. This partnership is really about the Marcuses in the state of Washington, and we would not be able to serve them without ensuring that we connect the dots of our individual agencies' missions. Uh, for juvenile rehabilitation, it's ensuring public safety. That's an aspect for uh, Pacific Mountain Workforce Development Council and the Division of Oak Rehab. It's exposure to the world of employment, early expo exposure. Um, and for DVR, it's also a way for us to utilize our 15% pre-ed set aside to provide needed services. Um, and for all of us, it's you know also about best practice, solid data and research. And Kathleen will discuss that a little bit later. And Kathleen will take this slide. No, Cheryl's going to take this slide. <laughs> this is Cheryl Fambles. Um, my Journey Out Beyond is a workforce development project um, born of the idea that not a single life should be wasted in the pursuit of economic prosperity. These young people that we're serving, they deserve nothing less, and our economy desperately needs them. Through my journey out beyond my job, we teach them to get ready to go to work, learning the skills to be successful in the workplace, communications, teamwork, dependability. Those are often coined as the soft skills, but um, for many people, and in particular these young people, they are not soft skills. So we we put them in through about 40 hours of in-classroom training. We give them an opportunity to explore real possibilities for work by understanding the labor market, how to prepare a resume and submit an application, what it means to have a portfolio and how to use it, and how to respond to the kinds of questions that they're going to get asked in an interview. And then we spend time with them on understanding the value of mentoring. And we provide those mentoring opportunities through the staff that are actually in the classroom working with these young people on the campuses of um, the juvenile rehabilitation facilities. We offer a speaker series that brings people into um, the classrooms. And then we're trying to help these young people to understand what it means to find a quality teacher and um, help them to, to learn to trust others as their teachers. There's a video link noted on this um, slide, but there are also additional um, resources for you on the packmountain.org website and the My Job page. Everything is about leveraging, and so Kathleen is going to tell you a little bit about that, um, that, that importance of leveraging our resources. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, when we first moved forward with this work, um, I think the first order of business was to determine if we were all in. Uh, I think it was trying to figure out whether this was going to be a shared or a siloed approach. 
I think we invited each other to find different opportunities or ways of building investments for all the parties involved, um, and most notably for Marcus, um, so that uh, the Marcuses of the world could uh, receive the services that not only do they need, but also that they deserve. Um, so when we, when we were kind of discussing what this looked like, uh, we knew that everyone had a contribution or an investment. And the schools looked for ways to dedicate space and really looked at their course catalog to determine what, what was the gap. And it was pretty clear that this was one area that, that they did not have a expertise in. Um, the experts really came from the workforce. So we, number one, needed to invite them in to teach the basics, and then to look for ways to possibly expand or enhance in other areas, such as vocational training. The juvenile justice uh, system, the state's juvenile justice system, um, were about the outcomes. And so keeping the end in mind, uh, we were looking at quality, uh, quality delivery of the program, as well as um, leading to effective outcomes, fidelity, sustainability, and replication. Washington does have a menu of research-based and evidence-based programs. And so this was definitely a foundation for us. Right, so um, when this partnership was introduced several years ago, the path to my job was not well defined, and the navigation to my job was a bit rough for several reasons. Um, first, DVR staff didn't understand how to best serve these youth, using the traditional, like, you come to us approach, and with the required timelines from eligibility to plan, it was difficult to see how these students could ever result in successful closures. So next uh, problem we had was, like from the justice-involved youth perspective, DVR staff could not easily build trust. And we had been doing orientations um, at some of the institutions where the students were held. Generally, the justice-involved students didn't see themselves as having disabilities. And if they did, they weren't about to tell anybody unless, you know, unless they be seen as weak or vulnerable. Trust is an important element. And because of DVR's relative inexperience with this population, which had been underserved, no doubt, um, students that did apply for services tended to fall through the cracks or didn't engage with our staff. They would inevitably wind up being closed cases without successful outcomes. One of the students told us, and I, I am quoting, how long does, it, does this mistake need to follow us, end quote. And I think our system was complicit in perpetuating stereotypes and further pushing the students away. And that's something that we had to address and had to, you know, we had to take the time to look ourselves in the mirror and say, what are we doing to, to you know, um, make this problem worse? Finally, I think from a partnership perspective, uh, we really also grappled with a lack of common language. For example, what we call transition, what we call youth, and how we define services uh, created barriers that we had to navigate. So Rob has described some of the um, significant obstacles to success. And we do think that there are ways, and I think that we are a testimony to those ways to overcome those challenges. Um, and the, the number one, first and foremost, is that we have to keep the why. Why are we doing this work? And um, that very first slide that Rob showed you, Marcus, Marcus is the reason that we are doing this work. and. Um, recognizing that Marcus needs a chance to be a quality employee. Um, our partners, we rely on them to, to have them tell us the truth and to help us understand where we're stepping into things that we, we don't understand. We're crossing systems that are, that are not known to one another. And so that part of the trust is that we know that each other has the other's back and that if we make a mistake that there will be grace um, and that we will work together to um, recruit, recoup it. 
you know, you, we have failed for many, many years, these young people. And so we have to do something different. And that level of creativity and innovation, um, it's, it's sometimes overwhelming. It does feel like we're designing and building and flying and painting and evaluating this plane as it's um, taking off. But it is what we must do. And that level of innovation and creativity, um, while it can prove, um, and I think we've got some results in the lives of these young people, it can, it can show some good works. It is also um, often a recipe for bedlam. And um, you have to be a little comfortable with some organized chaos. You have to trust the system. And you have to trust that your partners are going to be working with you towards those um, towards those outcomes. Um, the local schools, that um, each of the school districts that are embedded in the facilities that JR has, we need them as partners. And they have their own set of um, issues and challenges. But we have to get buy-in, um, not just in the use of their facilities, but they're the teachers, the known teachers on the campus. And we need them to um, see us as credible and as offering something valuable in, in the minds and in the learning opportunities for these young people. You know, we do use a curriculum. It is um, the work, um, Workplace Excellence Series curriculum. We've um, worked it for the last number of years. But um, it is so critical to be student focused. We um, go into these orientations, and there could be large numbers or could be small numbers. Um, we do one-on-ones. Wherever we are and however many there are, we have to focus on what that individual student needs and help them get what they need out of our collective systems. Um, our attention to these things, we think, have created places of triumph um, and some actual numbers. So Kathleen's going to tell you about those. OK. So um, we know that outcomes tend to drive pretty much the decisions that we make and uh, the partnerships that come together. But one, I think one of the biggest takeaways that uh, the partners have talked about um, across sometimes is not tangible. Uh, it is about, it may not be about the numbers or the percentages, and that these young people and these students actually see themselves now in the world of work. Uh, where they hadn't before. Um, as you can see, we're closing in. Uh, we kicked this off in 2016, and it wasn't fully implemented across three facilities, the largest facilities in the state, um, until well into 2017. But we're closing in on about 900 students participating in the My Jobs um, program to date. It is the largest employment, education, and training program in the state of Washington. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that particular part of our evidence-based or research-based program element of this. It is an individualized based program based on unique needs. And um, we are, are starting to see that um, not only spotlighting that these young people um, deserve the opportunity, but that um, this unique population ha has never actually um, been provided a program such as this that would really see them take steps once they return back to their home community to be a contributor to the community and to the economic growth of Washington State. So when, when we talk a little bit more about um, the next steps, uh, obviously we want to see what this program will do in the future. Um, how, how do the, um, how do the, uh, the students uh, interact in the world of work? And currently, ju juvenile rehabilitation is in the process of moving to a new department um, dedicated to children, youth, and families in the state of Washington. Um, 
the, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families actually has a dedicated research team that is very eager to analyze and, and look at some of the benchmarks that this program um, provides us and so that we can make any kind of process improvements, but also the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, which is our research arm of Washington State, has identified this program as a research-based program. Like I said, it is the largest program with education, employment, and training, which is a research-based program here in the state of Washington. And many of our county partners actually provide this element of the programming, um, but does not provide the My Jobs programming uh, across the state. I think there's uh, six pilot sites going on right now. Um, I think that when we look at how we um, improve and expand, it's also to really look at our systems um, independently are growing and evolving and learning. Uh, so we need to keep sharing that information with one another as this program continues on into the future. We, the juvenile justice system also last year um, moved to um, expanding our age population of service delivery up to the age of 25. And so we are now exploring what that evolution looks like for Washington State. And uh, our, our age population is an older population. Uh, average age is 17 and a half when young people return home. So they really do need to be, students really need to be thinking about um, the next steps in um, a career in um, independence and self-sufficiency. And we also want to take a look at how this program could be replicated in other populations, such as um, young people in the foster care system or child welfare system, as we move into the new department and serve a, a broader uh, pool of young people uh, moving forward. Thank you. So uh, this is Rob. Thank you for uh, you know spending some time with us, and we're we're happy to uh, take some questions. There was one question um, that came earlier, uh, where Brian had asked what kinds of students are in this my job, and I know that you have addressed um, students who are involved in the just, juvenile justice system. Um, do you want to elaborate at all for Brian? Yes, uh, I think Kathleen. Want to take this one? Yeah, actually, um, these are young people in the juvenile justice system. However, they're also 87% of these young people are young people with behavioral health issues. Um, so they also touch other systems. 79% have had um, have touched the child welfare um, system previously. 80% qualify for Medicaid due to poverty. 50% um, are special ed. And then there's approximately about 30% that um, we have assessed as um, being 504 eligible. Um, and 25% experience homelessness within uh, a six-month period of release. And so um, and I want to just highlight 68% of these young people are youth of color compared to the state system of 30%. So they cross over multiple areas and not just uh, focused on the juvenile justice um, system. That's just one aspect. Um, and this is where the My Jobs program is actually delivered. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And can you expand a little bit on the comment you made regarding how you expanded your age group to um, be inclusive of those up through the age of 24? And is that from a VR side and a juvenile justice side, or just the VR side? So, um, so yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, Kathleen. OK. Sorry. Um, so the Actually, it's from the juvenile justice side. Um, Washington State, uh, as of last year, had served young people up to the age of 21. Uh, and with statutory changes, we are now serve and, and due to um, a better understanding of adolescent brain development, we have now moved the Washington State juvenile justice system to the age of 25. And so 
we're just evolving as um, we serve an older population. That is not specific to the My Jobs program. However, there will definitely need to be conversations about how that looks. And the My Jobs program, just so you're aware, um, it, it's, it's definitely served through VR, but there is a population that is not eligible for um, Priet's uh, services that we serve those young people separately. Um, it's the same program, but it, the, the resource is actually from a evidence-based research um, resource uh, fund that we serve the rest of the population. So we're ever evolving um, in how we serve young people um, through the world of work. Thank you. There's another question um, in the chat box from Laura that asks, how has this partnership helped in working with individuals who may not have traditionally qualified for VR services, and what were key elements in realizing their potential? So uh, this is Rob. I, I think that shifting our service delivery model with this population away from the, the traditional um, you know, come see us here at, at VR, we'll uh, take your application, we'll make you eligible. All of that, you know, looking at it that way created more barriers for these uh, individuals because, you know, first of all, they are being held, right? Um, and for us to have access to them was also an issue. And so when we started the partnership, we realized that, you know, it was, it was because we saw that our success you know, was not reaching um, a level that was acceptable. And it was for specifically between juvenile rehabilitation and VR. At the time, we were within the same administration. And so we were having leadership meetings about this. And so we looked at ways how, you know, how could we use the change in the law and the addition of PREETS to help us to identify students that are potentially eligible, right, as opposed to eligible. And so that was a, that was a game changer for us. So then we, you know, were able to identify them more readily because as Kathleen uh, went through the statistics, most of these students, by and large, had disabilities or they were, they were known to have a disability. And so um, we, we really were able to capitalize on that and using the partnership, get access to the students and then provide the services that were so, so needed. And if students are able to connect with VR, you know, once they get out of the institutions, um, we're able to work, you know, serve them through the traditional VR system. Thank you, Rob. Melanie would like to know if you connect with Washington's community-based supports, um, the publicly funded services for people with social and behavioral slash IDD substance abuse services. So, uh, are you asking within the context of the My Job program? I would assume so. It doesn't specify, but let's say it is. Well, so, um, you know, using pre-employment transition services as part of the My Job uh, service, you know, behavioral health, mental health treatment could be something that's going on within the institution, and maybe Kathleen can speak to that. Clarified just now, she said, are you connecting with the folks who provide long-term? Yeah, so um, we have a continuum of care. Uh, so young people are served in um, a residential setting and then step down back into the community. It's only at a 50% um, service delivery in the community and so um, through the juvenile justice system. So what we try to do is we have a very strong reentry program where we are connecting with young people and their families uh, within the first 30 days that they are with us. And we are starting to plan for their return if there are behavioral health uh, concerns or um, areas that we need to expand on. We are doing those linkages um, prior to young people being um, returned back home. And we want a plan uh, for those young people in their hands uh, that the that the 
families, the natural supports can get behind, and then it's meaningful for them and relevant to them. And so, yes, we are connecting with behavioral health uh, in conversations and services around trauma-informed or healing-centered approaches, as well as um, uh, uh, linkages to the mental health system. So, yes. And this is Cheryl. The career counselors that are located inside each of these facilities, working one-on-one -on -one with the students, recognizing that the day that they come in is the day that we start planning for their release. And so when they walk out the door, the goal is that they've got their portfolio. We call it a RISE plan, which is about release, integration, success, and empowerment. And it's how do they link back up to the resources in their community. So we've, we've tried over the course of the time with them, however much time we get with them, to enable them on the employment side to be as strong as possible with all of the resources that they walk out the door with. Where, where are the WIOA um, youth providers? How do I get to the one-stop centers? Where are the DVR counselors? Who can who can we hand in sort of a warm handoff fashion um, assist in the transition with these young people? So we're trying to put all of that into a plan that they actually walk out the door with. So um, behavioral health, all of the um, substance abuse, all of the workforce supports, are all, we try and build all of that into the plan. Thank you. And real quickly, Kimberly asked, are these three facilities that you implemented this in, are they secure, residential, community-based? Kathleen? Yeah, so um, the three um, uh, facilities are um, secure and partially secure. Um, they are not community-based, but we do have eight additional community-based facilities that many of the young people that uh, touch the My Jobs uh, program then step down into, and then they are linked to um, the workforce directly. There is some follow-up work that's being done with one uh, step-down uh, community-based facility that's connected to a manufacturing academy. And so there is, uh, I, I think I mentioned on one of the slides that expanding to the trades is one of the areas that we're exploring right now. Um, but they are residential facilities. Uh, one is a maximum security facility, and the other two are um, are um, lesser restrictive um, in terms of security. Thank you. Um, two more questions. One is, what advice would you give um, for partners getting a seat at the table when they work with a specific disability and the amount of customers are not as high as other disabilities? So maybe it's you know, it's not a priority for that agency to be serving a certain population. How can you get a seat at the table? Yeah, so this is Rob. I believe, um, you know, all of these types of initiatives, you know, have different uh, genesis. And, you know, for, I think for ours, it was, you know, within the same administration with, with uh, juvenile rehabilitation, we were looking at, um, you know, a population that was really not a huge population, right? It was, I don't, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was like 400 releases a year um, across the state um, over time, all over the state. And so this was kind of uh, a conversation that started because we saw a problem and we were working kind of closely together, but we were very disparate as far as our systems were concerned. So I, I just think that you have to start with, sometimes it's a tough conversation, and I think ours was. We had many meetings with JR leadership and DVR leadership where we talked about, you know, this, this, this group of uh, young people who just were not being um, provided services or provided opportunities. And we just had to sit down over a period of months and even years to, to kind of maintain that, that dialogue. And so I would say to begin the conversation, if it's a tough conversation, um, get in front of the decision makers and, and start to have those conversations to get a seat at the table. Any, uh, any other from Cheryl or Kathleen? 
I, I, well, oh, if Kathleen. you could just oh. real quickly. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. I, um, I think one other thing that kind of happened around the same time is uh, Governor Inslee actually uh, initiated a, a directive, an executive directive on uh, reentry. And so he tasks all of us, including vocational rehabilitation as well as the juvenile justice systems, uh, economic services, um, a number of different entities to pay attention to uh, young people as well as adults that were returning back to their home communities and what we could do differently to ensure um, future success. And one of those areas looked at employment pathways. And so uh, it's Executive Order 1605, and it was issued May of 2016 while we were having these conversations. So it kind of elevated our discussion. And then it was also trying to figure out what exactly um, we, we could see the problem in front of us. It wasn't a large number, like uh, Rob said. And it was to, to say that this could be a better investment long term um, when you speak about uh, reoffense, recidivism, and how we want to, to spend and invest in our young people for the future. This is Cheryl. I, I also wanted to comment on the, the question related to get, getting to the table. You know, my, my state partners um, here have been amazing to work with, but they do represent systems that can be difficult to find the door, right? Where, where do you enter? And as a local, um, you know, we are a locally based workforce council. I cover five counties. Two of the facilities that Kathleen is that we're talking about today are in my region. Um, being local, sometimes uh, you, you, if you rap on the door, you might find the door and you're pounding on it, but they don't always let you in. So I found figuring out who your local supports are and then banding together to identify a statement of need that can be put in front of the folks at the state. Because they do have these kinds of um, requirements, and often they want to do the work. They are, however, not very adept at seeing that the work is really local. And those of us who have local origins and are you know, in the community can often create success for them in ways that they had never believed before. So think about what it is that you can do to help them be successful in meeting their requirements. And along the way, you're going to serve better those young people coming back into your communities or leaving your communities to go to those places where um, we're serving them in, um, in those buildings. Thank you. That absolutely hit the mark. Um, could you touch briefly on the fiscal responsibility of each partner and how, how funds are braided or blended, who has responsibility for what, and how you divided that up? Yeah, this is Rob. So we have a, um, an interagency agreement with juvenile rehabilitation, and then they contract with Pacific Mountain Workforce Development Council. Um, and as, as far as the way it's, it's uh, braided there, uh, Kathleen alluded to the fact that for students that are outside of the age range for pre-employment transition services, they've identified other funds for those students. Pac Mountain also has brought funds to the table vis-a-vis -vis some of our um, governor initiative funds and our Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds. And it's, again, all about how do we get the services to these young people um, with the model. So the um, Kathleen, uh, I think talking about the Manufacturing Academy is a, good, um, is a good way to look at how we've braided these funds. And from the juvenile justice perspective, obviously um, the, the service delivery actually happens in our facilities as well as once young people move and transition, 
uh, juvenile justice has also not only taken a look and, um, in partnership with Pack Mountain, uh, applied for an evidence-based um, expansion uh, project connected to this program, but also we repurposed um, uh, positions uh, in the community um, across the state so that when young people actually go through the My Jobs program, they are then linked to employment specialists in the local community, and then they work with the local uh, workforce network to link and connect young people uh, to the jobs locally in their home communities. Okay, well we have come almost to the top of the hour and I want to thank all of the participants for joining us today and for your great questions and for our partners from Washington State and NYEC for sharing the information today. What a great um, model example of partners coming together and serving such an amazing population of youth to help them with reentry and success um, after their treatment programs. I do want to remind everybody to please complete the evaluation. Um, you have the link here up on the screen as well as in your slide deck um, to please give us um, your honest feedback. We apologize for the technical difficulties in the beginning of ensuring we had our captioning set up and everybody was ready to go. Um, and if you haven't already downloaded the PowerPoint, you can still from the top right part of the screen. The information from today's webinar will also be posted on our website after the, um, after the webinar. So I'm just going to keep this screen up here that has the evaluation link and again extend a sincere thanks to everybody who contributed to making today's webinar a success. Any other comments, Jessica? Uh, no, thank you, Kim, for everything. And again, if you desire to have CRC credits, please make sure that you complete the evaluation and email Jessica Fuentes Diaz um, so she can follow up with you when those have been um, approved. So thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day. We look forward to visiting with you again soon.